Uh, was a very warm welcome to everyone uh, on the ISA online PG classes. And these PG classes are held every mo uh, Monday evening from 6.30 p.m. with an initiative to benefit the postgraduate students of the country. And uh, because of the initiative by the uh, leadership of the ISA, uh, in the last few weeks, we have been discussing case presentations and case discussions are being held in which eminent faculty from different parts of the country from various reputed institutes are uh, taking part for the case discussions. And uh, today is no different. Today, uh, we have a case discussion by, uh, yes, we have a case discussion on obstructive jaundice and the anesthetic management. And uh, a second year PG student, Dr. Gokul Krishnan S from Kasturba Medical College, Manipal, uh, we'll be discussing this case and uh, to moderate uh, the session, we have two eminent faculty members, Dr. H.M. Krishna and Dr. Malvika Kulkarni. But uh, before we start the class, as is always the case with the PG classes, we will try and invoke the blessings of Yeah. So to help Dr. Gokul Krishnan and all the postgraduates of the country, we have Dr. Uh, H.M. Krishnan. He's the professor and head of Kasturba Medical College, Manipal. Uh, he has special interest in pediatric anesthesia and simulation in anesthesia. He is a regional faculty and training center coordinator for AHA training center at Manipal, a volunteer for the Operation Smile Incorporated and Mission Smile in India, a formal national executive council member, of the IAPA, that is the Indian Association of Pediatric Anesthesiologists. He has more than 50 publications to his credit and we are fortunate to have you, sir. Thank you so much. The other uh, faculty that we have is Dr. Malvika Kulkarni. She's additional professor at the Department of Anesthesia at Kasturba Medical College, Manipal. And uh, she completed her uh, anesthesia in 2008 from Hubli. She has a fellowship in pediatric anesthesia, which she completed in 2019 from Manipal itself. Uh, pediatric anesthesia is an area of special interest for her and she has predominantly worked uh, pursuing research in the pre-operative anxiety in children and for pre-operative anxiety in children she has authored a pediatric comic uh, information leaflet also presented various papers on different uh, difficult pediatric airway management at various conferences international and national and uh, also pediatric perioperative fluid management at various academic events she has many uh, published many research papers in peer-reviewed national and international journals of repute. So a very warm welcome uh, to both of them. For the benefit of uh, all, uh, all the listeners will be muted, sir and ma'am. And uh, during the course of this talk, just in case there are any questions, uh, the, the listeners are encouraged to type in the chat box. Uh, we can just take up all the questions after the uh, case discussion is over. Uh, I'm sure we'll have a lot of viewership because this is uh, such an important class, uh, obstructive jaundice. So uh, over to you, sir and ma'am, Dr. Dr. Krishna and Dr. Malvika, you may uh, please take over this uh, stage from here. Thank you, Dr. Nishant, for that uh, good introduction of us. I <clears throat> bring warm greetings from Kasturba Medical College, Manipal, respected ISA office bearers, the faculty members, who have joined us here and the postgraduate students. So we hope we'll have a fruitful discussion on the very important case of obstructive jaundice which is present, being presented for uh, surgery. Gokul Krishnan is our postgraduate student who, is, who will soon be going to his final year, the third year. So the flow of the class will be something like this. Gokul Krishnan will present the case for the first 10 to 15 minutes, after which we, the moderators, initially Dr. Malavika will take over the discussion, channeling the discussion on the preoperative assessment of the patient, focusing on the clinical history, clinical examination, the investigations that needs to be done. And then we go to the clinical aspects of the anesthetic management, which will be steered predominantly by me. 
So, Dr. Gokul, over to you to start presenting the case. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. A good evening to one and all gathered here. Could you switch on your video? Do you want to? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Starting with my case presentation on obstructive jaundice posted for Whipple's procedure. Google, just one minute. Could you please switch on your video also, please, so that we sir, can see? Uh, I'm trying, sir, but uh, it's I'm not able to open my video. Okay. Okay, you, you can continue if you want then. Okay, sir. Can I proceed, sir? Uh, sir, should we proceed, Dr. Krishna? Yeah, it would have been nice to see Gokul on the screen as sir, he's uh, I'll try changing the device, sir, if is it okay or... Uh... No, 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 you don't, you know, you can change the device later on once the question, uh, this one yes, presentation yeah, is finished. You start yes, presenting. okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. So, a uh, 78-year-old gentleman came with a chief complaints of yellowish discoloration of skin for one year, loss of appetite and weight loss for three months, clay-colored stools for one month. So, history of presenting illness. The patient was apparently normal one year back, after which he noticed yellowish discoloration of skin. And also, he gives a history of loss of appetite and weight loss of around 10 kgs over a period of three months. And a history of three to four episodes of clay-colored stools per week for one month. And history of itching all over the body for three weeks. History of dark-colored urine for one week. So, no history of fever chills, arthralgia or myalgia, no history of abdominal pain or distension, no history suggestive of dyspnea on lying down or on exertion or on standing, history suggestive of moderate effort tolerance, no history suggestive of hematemesis, petechase, ecchymosis or hematochesia, no history of decreased urine output, no history suggestive of altered sensorium. History of past history, uh, patient is nilpri coma bit. No history of similar complaints in the past. No history of any previous medication intake. No history of chemotherapy or radiotherapy or blood transfusion in the past. No history of any re recent travel outside. No history of tattooing. No previous surgeries in past. Personal history, he consumes a mixed diet. Bladder habits are regular. Bowel habits are also regular. Normal sleep pattern, consumes alcohol occasionally twice a month for five years, approximately around 60 to 90 ml. He's a not, he's not a smoker. Family history, no significant family history. So coming to general examination, Patient is conscious, oriented to time, place, person, thin built, malnourished, height of 160 centimeter, weight of 45 kg, mid arm circumference of 20 centimeter, BMA of 17.4 kg per meter square. Vital signs pulse rate of 92 per minute, rhythm regular, low volume pulse, no vessel wall thickening. No radio radial or radio femoral delay. Blood pressure 100 systolic and 66 diastolic, measured in left arm in sitting posture. 97 percentage of saturation at room air. Respiratory rate 16 per minute, which is abdominal thoracic in type. So head to foot examination, no paler. Ictus is present in the sclera. No clubbing or uh, cyanosis or no generalized lymphadenopathy, no pedal edema, no signs of liver cell failure, and scratch marks were present. Airway examination, no loose tooth or dentures, mouth opening of three-finger breath, 
temporomandibular joint, supplexible, thyromental distance, three, uh, three finger breadth, modified malambity, class two, neck movements were adequate. Upper lip bite test, class one. So coming to systemic examination, peri-abdominal examination, inspection, scaphoid in shape, planks are free, no visible pulsation, umbilicus is in center, inverted, all parts of abdomen move equally with respiration, no visible mass or scar, hernial orifice and genitalia are normal. On palpation, no tender, no guarding or rigidity, no rebound tenderness, liver palpable below right subcostal margin, which is regular, firm in consistency, moves with respiration. No other organomegaly. Percussion, tympanic note, heard in all quadrants, no shifting dullness, liver dullness noted at fifth intercostal space. Auscultation, bowel sounds heard, no venous arms or arterial bird, respiratory system, bilateral air entry present, normal vesicular breath sounds heard in all areas. Cardiovascular system, S1, S2 heard, no murmur, apex beat felt half inch medial to the mid clavicular line. Central nervous system, higher mental functions normal, no focal neurological deficit, all cranial nerve examinations are normal. S summarizing, sir, 78 year old male who is an ill pre comorbid presented with painless progressive jaundice with clay-colored stools and with pruritus and loss of appetite, with no signs of hepatic failure, suggestive of uh, obstructive jaundice, came for further evaluation and management. Gokul, that was an extensive history and an examination. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. So what positive findings you have found in your history which has pointed to your, your diagnosis? So, ma'am, uh, my patient, ma'am, came with the yellowish discoloration, ma'am, uh, of the skin and with clay colored stool and high colored, high colored urine, ma'am, which points towards obstructive pat pattern of jaundice, ma'am, from history, ma'am. So, which are the sites you look for uh, jaundice? In the body, ma'am, uh, in the sclera, ma'am, and base of tongue, and uh, if the bilirubin levels are high, even in the skin and the peripheries can also be seen, ma'am. So primarily, you look for features of jaundice in the skin, sclera, and the mucous membrane. Yes, Am I right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So in case you do not find the hello 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 yes Gokul, can you hear me yes sir i can hear you but i can't i can't hear ma'am yeah, it's okay maybe she's having some technical issues so you okay. said hello discoloration so we yes, Right where it is seen earliest. Sir, earlier, if it is more than 3 milligram per deciliter, it will be visible in the sclera, sir, and the base of tongue. Okay. And then, where, 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 what are the other sites that you look at? Sir, uh, skin and uh, periphery, sir. Palms, soles, if the bilirubin levels are high. Okay. Now, you said that the features that you elicited from the history is suggestive of obstructive jaundice. What are the yes, other sir. types of jaundice that you know about? Sir, there are three types of jaundice, sir. Prehepatic, hepatic, and post-hepatic, sir. So prehepatic is primarily of hemolysis, sir. So hemolysis uh, uh, presents with uh, splenomegaly as well as high-colored urine. Whereas hepatic will have a right uh, upper quadrant uh, pain along with jaundice, sir. In case of a post-hepatic, which is mostly of a obstructive pattern, where the conjugated bilirubin levels are high, 
so uh, it uh, it might that the salts might deposit in the skin leading to pruritus as well as uh, the bile salts won't reach the intestine though so that uh, stool color will be pale so most likely because of this can you can you tell in detail why the stools are clay colored in obstructive jaundice and the urine is high colored sir okay sir so normally sir from a, a normal metabolism uh, after the no, rbc's lifespan of 120 days the heme heme gets degraded in the reticulo endothelial system sir so the heme which is uh, in the reticulo endothelial system gets converted into a billy burden by heme oxygenase want to use the, any slide to explain that to, yes, to the audience you can yes, go ahead with that Yes, sir. So uh, the he heme in the reticulo endothelial system, heme gets converted into a billy burden by heme oxygenase, and billy burden to a unconjugated billy rubin by billy burden reductase. So this unconjugated billy rubin is is water insoluble, sir. So it goes to the uh, liver, and where the liver uh, with the UDP glutenal transferase, it gets conjugated, becoming making it as a water soluble. and uh, it gets uh, uh, ex uh, gets uh, excreted via the common uh, hepatic duct into the common bile duct and to, into the intestine so intestine contains intestinal bacteria with the help of beta glucuronidase the intestinal bacteria converts again into the again it deconjugates it and where the 80 percentage gets converted into a sterco bilirubin and gets excreted via stool and the 20 percentage enters the hepatic uh, enterohepatic circulation and where the 5 percentage enters the bl uh, blood and uh, excretes in the urine sir how do you classify jaundice so uh, jaundice is classified ma'am uh, based upon the prehepatic hepatic and post hepatic ma'am so uh, the prehepatic is because of hemolysis the hepatic is because of the uh, uh, hepatitis and uh, uh, the drugs drugs causing uh, uh, it can be infections or uh, other cause and uh, the uh, causes ma'am and as post post hepatic causes are the obstructive obstructive is because of the biliary uh, sto stones or strictures or carcinomas okay so what differences in the bilirubin you expect in these different types of jaundice Yes, ma'am. In a hemolytic jaundice, in a uh, prehepatic jaundice, your indirect, that is, the unconjugated levels are more. So your indirect level of bilirubin will be more. Whereas in a hepatic jaundice, both the direct and indirect levels will be more. In case of a a post-hepatic, that is, obstructive jaundice, your conjugated, that is, your direct bilirubin levels will be more, ma'am. Okay. So what is the what kind of uh, rise in the bilirubin concentration you expect in these types of jaundice where is it more severe where is it less ma'am uh, it uh, in in case of uh, uh, malignancies ma'am the level will be more higher ma'am but it uh, will be more than 20 mg per deciliter whereas in case of cholelithiasis or a uh, uh, bile stones the level will be comparatively lesser than that of a uh, compared to a malignancy ma'am so what is the type of jaundice uh, in your presentation mama it from the history it looks like an it points towards obstructive jaundice ma'am with further investigations i would like to confirm my diagnosis what are the common causes for obstructive jaundice mama ma migration of uh, gall stones from the gall bladder which is called as cholelithiasis or biliary stricture following an uh, cholangitis or an periampillary carcinomas cholangiocarcinomas or an uh, pancreatic carcinomas that is compressing the uh, outflow ma'am okay so with respect to this uh, case what do you think the possible etiology could be ma'am from uh, the etiology uh, might be because uh, of uh, malnourishment when weight loss it can be a malignancy ma'am but uh, it it is a differential ma'am it is a, one of the differential diagnosis on further evaluation with the 
exam i mean uh, with the investigations only i can say it is an malignant tumor okay so now let us discuss something about the physiology of the liver okay ma'am so what is unique about the hepatic physiology so the hepatic physiology ma'am the blood supply blood supply uh, is from the uh, portal vein and the hepatic artery the portal vein its 80 percentage of the blood is from the portal vein and 20 percentage from the hepatic artery whereas the oxygen supply is 50 percent in both ma'am 50 percentage from the portal vein 50 percent from the hepatic artery and uh, uh, and the uh, and the blood uh, goes through the inferior vena cava through hepatic vein ma'am uh, uh, and uh, the unit of uh, uh, the functional unit of a liver is the acinus ma'am which is uh, which is by, which is covered by the terminal hepatic artery hepatic arterial buffer response ma'am so it is the response of the hepatic artery to the portal vein ma'am to the blood flow to the change uh, to the uh, changes in the uh, portal vein ma'am so if the if the blood flow to the portal vein decreases your hepatic artery uh, responds by causing an vasodilatation ma'am but the, the the vice versa doesn't occur ma'am only the hepatic artery uh, can uh, modify it ma'am okay so there is a semi reciprocal relationship the vice versa okay. cannot happen isn't yes, it yes ma'am yes ma'am okay so you are saying about the functional unit of the liver yes ma'am can you Asinous elaborate on that acinus ma'am and uh, and it contains each uh, uh, each can you explain it with your slide yes ma'am so this is a lobule ma'am uh, which consists of a central vein in the middle and the portal triad in the periphery ma'am so the portal triad includes uh, portal vein hepatic artery and the bile duct so uh, between the portal triad and the central vein are the three zones ma'am so the zone 1 is a peri periportal zone and the zone 3 is close to the central vein ma'am so uh, so zone 3 is more prone for ischemia ma'am and uh, uh, the phase 1 reaction so the phase 1 reaction which includes uh, uh, oxidation reduction and hydrolysis and uh, the enzyme cytochrome p450 Occurs at the zone three, ma'am. Where, whereas in zone one, conjugation uh, uh, and uh, sulfonation uh, happens in zone one, ma'am. Phase two, phase uh, two reactions. Glycogen synthesis occurs in which of these zones, ma'am? Uh, zone one, ma'am. Zone one. And how long do the glycogen stores last, ma'am? Uh, it it lasts for. Uh, Six to eight hours, ma'am. No? It's about up to around forty-eight hours. Forty, okay, forty-eight hours, okay. Okay, so glycogen okay. stores last about forty-eight hours. So in obstructive jaundice, there is a tendency for patients to go into hypoglycemia. So now, can you explain about the pathophysiological effects of cholestasis? Okay, ma'am. So, so the main pathophysiology is that the uh, that where exactly the obstruction could occur and how. Yeah, does it impact the liver? Yes, ma'am. So the obst obstruction can happen between the hepatocyte to the ampule of water, ma'am. So anywhere the obstruction will you lead. You can explain to... it with your slide. If... Yes, ma'am. So uh, anywhere between the hep uh, hepatocyte till the ampule of water. Uh, so so that there will be a retrograde. Uh, the flow of uh, bile ma'am so it will enter the bile, the bile salts will enter the blood so the entering the blood the bile salts accumulates in the various systems ma'am there will be symptom uh, various systems will be affected ma'am so the first system the cvs uh, in a cardiovascular system by the intrabiliary pressure the yes ma'am there will be increase in Hmm. There will be increase in the uh, biliary pressure, ma'am. The retrograde flow. So when there is an obstruction, there is cholestasis. Yes, ma'am. So ma that increases the pressure within the biliary canal, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. That will lead to the uh, bile salts getting into the blood and reaching the various systems, ma'am. Yeah. So in cardiovascular system, the bile salts will have a negative ionotropic effect and negative chronotropic effect, 
as well as the bile salts might get deposited on the conductive system and might prone for a bradyarrhythmia asthma and uh, the uh, bile salts has uh, decreases your systemic vascular uh, uh, resistance also ma'am so the uh, more prone for uh, hypotensions ma'am uh, these patients and uh, other than that uh, uh, the patient have uh, like cardiomyopathy ma'am obstructive jaundice uh, cardiomyopathy pattern ma'am and uh, and other systems renal ma'am what about their response to the vasopressors uh there will be decreased beta adrenergic response ma'am so uh there will be a decreased response ma'am okay. so they can go into resistant they, hypotension resistant they might, yes. might not respond to the hmm. drugs and the next system ma'am renal system ma'am so uh renal system there will be a decreased blood flow to the renal uh, blood vessels ma'am it may be because of the endotoxin with of the retrograde ma'am uh so the re the reduced blood flow will decrease the gfr and might cause a acute uh, kidney injury or the bile salts might itself accumulate in the uh, tubules leading to an acute tubular uh, uh, injury ma'am okay. so these patients adequate hydration uh, is necessary and the urine output is necessary to be monitored right the, yes ma'am and other than that the bile salts won't reach intestine ma'am so there will be a growth of the uh, bacterial translocation ma'am so the bacterial translocation will lead to in endotoxemia ma'am so patient might go for sepsis and the uh, sepsis is also thing uh, have to be considered in case of obstructive jaundice ma'am any other systemic involvement ma'am ma'am uh, other than that uh, the the there can be a malnutrition ma'am because of the uh, nutrition is not uh, uh, mal absorption ma'am uh, malnutrition and the vitamin deficiencies ma'am so vitamin uh, fat uh, fat absorption to for fat absorption to occur you need a bile ma'am bile acts as a emulsifier agent for fat absorption so bile won't be there in intestine so that might lead to an vitamin a deficiency leading to night blindness vitamin d deficiency leading to osteoporosis or demineralization fractures vitamin k deficiency the vitamin k factors like 2 7 9 10 the, these are synthesized by the liver but the vitamin k is important for them to get activated gamma carboxylation ma'am so that won't happen so they might go for an uh, vitamin k deficiency bleeding disorders ma'am and the vitamin e vitamin e uh, will have cog cognitive dysfunctions also can occur so in acute liver dysfunction yes ma'am which which one of the synthetic functions is lost fast faster ma'am pro uh, factor 7 has the shortest half life of 6 hours ma'am so the extrinsic pathway uh, of the co coagulation that uh, that can be measured by prothrombin time which measures a uh, factor 2 5 7 and 10 so uh, it might uh, give you an uh, gives gives us an uh, early indicator so coagulopathy is one of the features of obstructive Acubular. jaundice because yes, of malabsorption of vitamin k fats and subsequently the vitamin k is also not synthesized okay yes, right yes, which other systemic involvement can be there mama other than uh, other than that uh, hypovolemia ma'am uh, the their uh, their thirst response and all hypothalamus uh, axis get affected so they are they don't have a thirst and decreased water intake so they are mostly in a state of an uh, hypovolemic state ma'am dehydrated state so that has already been discussed now yeah. what about the immune system yes ma'am uh, that uh, the immune response immune system will be decreased ma'am because of Why? the endobacterium uh, endotoxemia uh, leading to a decrease in the uh, so they are more prone for gram negative sepsis right yes ma'am gram negative sepsis ma'am which cells perform the phagocytic function in the liver kaffer cells ma'am kaffer cells 
uh, perform the phagocytic. All right. So, what is the cause of pruritus? Bile salts being a deposit, uh, getting deposited in the skin, uh, leading to pruritus. Okay. So, how would you like to proceed? I, uh, so, I would like to uh, further ask for the uh, investigations, ma'am, uh, to confirm my diagnosis. Uh, I would like to ask uh, the uh, al uh, AST, ALT, alanine transferase, aspartate transferase, and alkaline phosphatase. So, you enumerate the liver function tests and yes, classify them as to how, which are the tests for synthesis. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, test for cholestasis. Yes, ma'am. And test for uh, of metabolism and excretory functions of the liver. Yes, ma'am. Sure, ma'am. So, uh, in uh, alanine transferase is more specific to liver, ma'am. In case of a liver injury, the alanine transferase increases, ma'am. Whereas uh, aspartate transferase, which is uh, which is a uh, um, in, which increases in case of a more of a alcoholic liver injury, ma'am. The ratio will be higher when compared to the uh, alanine transferase. So the alkaline phosphatase increases in uh, in both as well uh, in case of uh, cholestasis, ma'am. But it is not very specific to cholestasis. In case of a uh, bone uh, bone disorders, also the uh, chances of uh, uh, the alkaline phosphatase increases, ma'am. So why the, does alkaline phosphatase increase in obstructive joint? Ma'am, uh, so the alkaline uh, phosphate is uh, it's a marker for the cholestasis, ma'am. Yeah, why? So um, it why is, doesn't uh, it increase in hepatocellular jaundice? Ma'am, it is synthesized in the biliary canaliculi, ma'am. Like hmm. biliary canaliculi, so it's more uh, specific for uh, cholestasis. It is an enzyme which is synthesized by the cells of lining so, the biliary biliary canaliculi. Yes, ma'am, lining of the bilinical. So, mm -hmm. so, so in cholestasis, due to the obstruction, there is no pathway. Yes, the pathway is blocked. So, then it gets into the systemic circulation. Yes, ma'am. That's how alkaline phosphatase is elevated. So, yes, you said it is not specific for the liver. Where else it is produced? Ma'am, it can be increased in cases of uh, uh, bone, bone disorders also, ma'am. So, which, uh, which other organs? Mama, a bone disorders, ma'am, uh, or uh, uh, in case of uh, mostly bone disorders, it increases, ma'am. Agreed. Yes. But it can also be synthesized in the kidney placenta. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Okay, ma'am. So, how much of elevation is significant for you? Ma'am, greater than the four times the normal, ma'am. It's uh, uh, four to five times the normal is a significant one. Okay. In case you find an elevated alkaline phosphatase, is that sufficient enough or would you like to investigate further? Ma'am, since it is being synthesized in multiple places, it is not very uh, reliable, ma'am. So I would go for an uh, other, ma'am, gamma glutarate transpeptidase, which is more specific for uh, cholestasis, ma'am, or 5-nucleotase, which is uh, more. Uh, Specific and reliable. Okay. So, what other tests of liver functions you would look for? Ma'am, uh, co a coagulation profile, uh, prothrombin time, INR, and uh, uh, activated partial thromboplasm time, ma and uh, albumin, ma'am. Albumin, total protein. Uh, I would like to ask under bilirubin level, total bilirubin, uh, direct and indirect bilirubin level. I'd like to is albumin the only protein which is synthesized in the liver? No, ma'am. Uh, albumin is one of the proteins, ma'am. Okay, please speak loudly and clearly. Yes, ma'am. Okay, sir. So, uh, sir, albumin is one of the uh, proteins, sir. Uh, uh, so, other uh, there are a lot of uh, carrier proteins, uh, and uh, uh, other than that, hormonal uh, uh, proteins uh, and growth uh, factors also uh, synthesized from the liver, sir. Like, what uh, about like globulin? Globulin also, ma'am. So what is it? Yeah, what happens in uh, jaundice? What happens to globulin? 
ma'am uh, globalin uh, uh, levels are like not affected much ma'am but i'm not sure ma'am albumin is decrease globalin levels can increase okay ma'am okay, okay ma'am you also okay. see the albumin to globalin ratio yes ma'am what is the half life of albumin ma'am 18 to 20 days ma'am yeah how much of albumin is synthesized in the liver ma'am per day 15 grams of albumin is uh, synthesized in a day ma'am so why is it important so uh, so since the half life uh, uh, like it's 18 to 20 days ma'am so you can't predict the like uh, the early damage like whether the synthetic function can't, can't be determined by the albumin ma'am so there won't be decrease till that half life of 18 to 20 days ma'am so uh, so albumin is not a reliable uh, synthetic uh, 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 function what is the role of albumin in drug metabolism ma'am uh, drug binding ma'am if the albumin levels are low increase free fraction of drug increase uh, toxicity and uh, uh, yes ma'am is the drug elimination prolonged in obstructive jaundice ma'am yes ma'am uh, many drugs that undergo biliary biliary excretion like neuromuscular blockage majority of the drugs uh which undergo biliary excretion uh because of the biliary excretion uh, getting obstructed the uh, duration is prolonged is it related to the severity of obstructive jaundice and subsequent hepatocellular involvement yes ma'am it's it depends upon the hype, uh, how how uh, level of the bilirubin ma'am higher the level of bilirubin the longer the prolongation ma'am so what would you like to how would you like to handle this situation so ma'am if if a patient has a coagulopathy uh, i would like to optimize ma'am i would like to keep the inr of below 1.5 how would and, you like uh, to keep this inr below 1.5 ma'am uh, fresh flowing plasma ma'am uh, 15 ml per kg ma'am now here your patient is posted for the whipple's procedure an yes, elective ma'am. procedure yes ma'am. do you have enough time to optimize this patient with regard to coagulopathy in yes, case inr is say around uh, 1.7 or something yes ma'am so since a whipple is a uh, major surgery in, involving a uh, increased flu, uh, fluid shifts and blood loss so uh, i would like to optimize the uh, make the inr below of 1.5 and take up the case ma'am hello 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 ma'am yeah so how would you like what treatment would you like to give here ma'am uh, fresh frozen plasma ma'am 15 ml per kg uh, the question was you have enough time to correct the coagulopathy so what how would you go about it is fresh frozen plasma indicated for all cases ma'am uh, uh, no ma'am so uh, vitamin k ma'am vitamin k is my first choice ma'am so vitamin vitamin k uh, 10 mg uh, before three days uh, three subsequent doses ma'am subcutaneous yeah it takes at least three days for the effects of vitamin k to become evident yes ma'am right yeah yes ma'am do you want to share your screen or uh, is it okay because your screen is not seen the slide is not seen if there oh, are yes, any more slides to show from your side you can once again share your screen otherwise it's fine yes, yeah please go ahead it's seen now yes okay so now let's go back to your pre operative preparation so yes, you said that you would like to ask for your uh, the liver function test what yes, other investigations would you like to ask for in this case ma'am i would like to get an uh, complete blood count ma'am uh, uh, and why reason yes, it out uh, yes ma'am uh, anemia ma'am uh, so i uh, if at all anemia i would like to correct it and take it up and the platelet uh, platelet i want to know ma'am uh, the baseline platelets for the surgery and the total count might be increased because of the uh, sepsis ma'am so i i i want to uh, see that also ma'am and uh, renal function test also ma'am 
because uh, we already discussed earlier that the oxidative jaundice might have a uh, impairment over the renal function. So creatine, uh, I would I would like to get the RFT with electrolytes, ma'am. Electrolytes and co coagulation propane acid ma earlier with uh, liver function test, ma'am. Whatever I do, and uh, I would like to get a baseline ECG, ma'am, and echocardiography, ma'am, because my patient is a seventy-eight year old, uh, older. Uh, uh, fr uh, frail, I mean, uh, geriatric gentleman. So I would like to uh, get the ECG and the cardiac workup also to be done. Any other investigation? And the chest X-ray, ma'am. Chest yeah. X-ray also I, uh, I would like to get and... Uh, yes. Okay, what else? How would you like to prepare the patient for surgery? Yes, ma'am. Uh, if... Uh, uh, I would like to, if the, my patient is malnourished, ma'am, if, if the adequate time is there, uh, I will uh, adequate nutrition to replenish the glycogen stores, high carbohydrate diet, I will uh, ask him to, uh, high protein, high carbohydrate diet, uh, and uh, adequate hydration, as we discussed earlier, ma'am, uh, the, the patient might be having hypovolemia, so adequate hydration, uh, uh, I will ask him to take under uh, if at all patient, uh, like I'll put him on a maintenance clothes if, uh, in a, uh, prior to the surgery, ma'am. And uh, if at all, blood, uh, if, uh, uh, if the blood HB is below uh, eight, uh, 9 or 10, I would like to transfuse one point PRPC and uh, take up the case. Ma and do an, uh, uh, since it is a uh, my major surgery involving fluid shifts and all, and uh, to avoid post-op pulmonary complications, I will do ask him to do the chest physio and uh, like incentive spirometry, ma'am, uh, pre-operatively. Okay, good. Anything else? What pre-operative instructions you would like to give? So, uh, ma'am, pre-operative instructions. Uh, I will first uh, get the concern for a uh, uh, general general anesthesia, ma'am. Uh, uh, involving endotracheal tube intubation with intermittent positive pressure ventilation and epidural analgesia, ma'am, and with invasive BP monitoring. And I'll also get the concern for intraoperative blood transfusion. And I'll also get the concern for uh, central venous catheterization, ma'am, and uh, intraarterial BP monitoring also, ma'am. And I'll also get the concern for post-op mechanical ventilation because of uh, increased uh, duration of surgery. Uh, so. I will uh, I will explain the need for post op ventilation uh, and uh, book an ICU bed as a backup. Are there are there any prognostic markers of yes, in this uh, condition? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, this patient is posted for Whipple's. So, yes. what do you expect the prognosis to be here? Ma'am, uh, old age, ma'am. Old age is uh, one of the uh, prognostic factors, ma'am, and uh, malignancy. Is uh, one of the poor prognostic factors, ma'am. And uh, hyperbilirubinemia, like more than uh, uh, 12 or uh, 12 to 15, uh, is considered to be a uh, poor prognostic factor, ma'am. And azotemia uh, is also an, uh, another uh, poor uh, prognostic factor. And what else? Uh, Anemia, nutritional deficiency. Yes, ma'am, nutrition. Yes, All these nutrition. point towards poor prognosis. Malnutrition, yes, ma'am. Krishna, sir? Yeah. So, Gokul. Sir? You know, you have been speaking continuously, so probably your voice is fading a bit. Uh, sorry, sir. Speak loudly and keep the device closer to you. Okay? Uh, sure, sir. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Yeah, you have uh, nicely summarized the physiology of the liver, the important functions of the liver, the pathophysiology that is seen behind the jaundice and obstructive jaundice in particular. You discussed how various systems in the body are involved when there is an obstructive jaundice. You also told us about how you would be evaluating the different functions of the liver, how you would be investigating the patient for a major surgery that he is scheduled for. Okay. So, and you have even prepared the patient, taken the consent, everything is ready for the surgery. Now, okay, a couple of observations before we proceed to anesthetize this patient. Whenever you speak of history, history should always be in the words of the patient. Yes. Yes. Don't use the terminologies like petiche, hematochesia. Sometimes we medical people ourselves don't understand what those mean. 
So definitely the patient wouldn't understand those. So try to mention whatever you tell in the history in the words of the patient. And okay. be prepared for the questions about whatever you have told in the negative history. Why did you ask for the travel history, the tattoo history, the injection history, whatever it is. There could be so many questions on those. Right. Okay. So let's move to anesthetize this patient. Okay. okay sir. So on okay. the morning of the surgery, what okay. would you do? Sir, I would like to prepare the OT, sir, first with the emergency drugs and the, uh, and the anesthetic drugs and the pre protocolized machine check. And I will keep an uh, central venous catheter kit, uh, in, uh, in, uh, invasive blood pressure monitoring kit, ultrasound machine, and uh, I will uh, warm a temperature probe, uh, fluid warmer, uh, body warmer, uh, uh, temperature probe, and uh, I, I would uh, ask the patient to wear a DVT uh, prior to surgery itself. I will ask the patient to wear a DVT stockings because of the prolonged uh, duration of the uh, surgery, sir. And uh, uh, and other than that, I would like to uh, uh, keep uh, uh, yes, sir. Keep uh, keep the OT ready with the whatever uh, I've said, sir. How much do you want your patient to fast before the surgery? Sir, uh, uh, I would like to ask, uh, ask the patient to fast uh, uh, so, uh, solids of six to eight hours, sir. Heavy, very fit of high fatty meals, eight hours, and uh, liquids of like two hours, uh, clear liquids at least two hours before the surgeries. And uh, I would like to, uh, like in pre op, uh, uh, pre anesthetic assessment itself, I like to ask the patient to, uh, I will write the uh, like IV fluids orders, sir. So patient is will be already hypovolemic. So I'll put the put the patient on a uh, maintenance uh, IV fluids, sir, balance salt solution, uh, maintenance, and uh, I'll ask them to ch uh, check the sugar levels also uh, uh, because of the NPOs. Right. So you have prepared your patient. You have given your instructions in the yes, OT. Sir. What's your plan of anesthesia? Sir, uh, I would like to, uh, uh, my plan of anesthesia is in general anesthesia with endotechal tube intimation with intermittent positive pressure ventilation and epidural analgesia, sir. Thoracic epidural analgesia, sir. So before you plan for thoracic epidural analgesia, what are the investigation reports that you would look at? Sir, I will look at the coagulation profile, sir, uh, on the platelets and the, uh, uh, yes, sir. With what values you would go ahead and with what values you would defer? Sir, INR of below 1.5, I'll go ahead, sir. And uh, platelets of uh, more than 1 lakh, uh, I would like to go ahead, sir. Yes, though we usually stick to these numbers, is it really very logical to stick to these numbers in liver dysfunction? What is your opinion? Sir, uh... When these numbers are altered, do you yes, always sir. see problems with clotting? Do you yes, always sir. see bleeding? Yes, sir. Uh, if not, I will do an uh, uh, thromboelastography to assess it and uh, take it. I'm not, I'm, not better value, I'm not hinting that you should be ignoring these numbers, but we also yes, need sir. to keep in mind that liver dysfunction it's not only the clotting system that is affected, but the other system in the coagulation profile, coagulation cascade, that is the fibrinolytic system is also equally affected. So okay. though you find abnormal numbers, sometimes you might not see abnormality in bleeding. But that doesn't okay. mean that you ignore these numbers because they could have medical legal implications, right? So you have planned your general endotracheal Anesthesia along with epidural analgesia. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Sir, yes, sir. Uh, uh, after shifting them, the patient connecting the standard, standard ASA monitors, uh, which includes uh, uh, NIBP, uh, pulse oximeter, temperature, ECG, ECG and uh, ETCO2. And uh, I will uh, uh, and I'll check the baseline values and uh, position the patient for an thoracic epidural at the, uh, with the mid thoracic level, sir. Uh, T2 to T6, uh, mid thoracic level, I would like to secure an epidural, sir. After securing the epidural, I would like to uh, uh, induce, uh, induce a patient, sir. Uh, with, uh, I like to pre-oxygenate, pre-oxygenate for three. 
three three minutes with hundred percent. What level did you say you will be putting the epidural catheter? Mitorashic level, sir. Level, sir. Uh, T six. No. T six. T four. T six. So wouldn't T two be too high for a liver surgery? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so like T six to T seven at, at that level. You are slowly coming down now. Sir, I want the. Okay. So you you are you are putting an epidural uh, catheter. What's your plan for epidural analgesia? What drugs would you be using? Yes, sir. Uh, so I would like to uh, start uh, with. Uh, um, Point one two five percent BUP vacuum with uh, fentanyl uh, to two microgram per cc, sir. I would like to avoid morphine because morphine can cause a, a contraction of the spinter of body. So, do you mean to say that the morphine that you give epidurally will cause contraction of the spinter of body? So. Uh, uh, Usually they say it's contraindicated in an obstructive sir. I'm not sure, sir, but uh, like theoretically I've read like that. So. Which of the two drugs, fentanyl and morphine, would cause more of contraction of sphincter of OD? Morphine, sir. Morphine. Are you sure? Isn't it fentanyl? Sir, I've read like morphine, sir, but I'm not you sure. Sir, but... Morphine. So examiner will ask your reference. Okay. So is sure, it fentanyl sir. or morphine? And would giving the drug in the epidural space cause a significant contraction of sphincter of OD? Number one. Number two, mm -hmm. is contraction of sphincter of OD a significant problem with regards to Whipple's surgery? We are not doing an endos ERCP procedure in this patient where you know you can't catheterize, you can't put in the catheter because of the contraction of the sphincter of OD. So we need to see what procedure also when we are considering the you know, the concern of contraction of sphincter of OD. Is morphine really contraindicated in these patients? Uh, Obstructive jaundice patients. Uh, theoretically, and intravenously. Theoretically, I have read like that. I remember like I have read, sir, but I have not applied clinically or uh, like I haven't seen, sir. So I am not able to say anything. No, no. My question is, Gokul, can we use morphine in these patients with obstructive jaundice or is it absolutely contraindicated? Sir, uh, we can use, sir. Uh, we can use. The, yes, the ability of the liver to metabolize the liver is preserved, maintained till even the end part of the end stage liver disease. Okay, okay sir. And the metabolism of morphine is predominantly dependent on what? On what? Uh, your uh, hepatic extraction. Hepatic, hepatic extraction ratio, sir. Blood flow rather than the, the the limiting factor is not the metabolism, metabolic capacity of the liver cell. It's the blood flow that supplies the opioids to the liver. So the ability to metabolize these drugs is maintained almost till the end of the end stage liver disease. So giving a single dose will not be a major concern. It's only with the repeated doses or an infusion of these opioids, which is going to be a concern. So you chose to use 0.125% bupivacaine with fentanyl, probably incremental inje uh, injections followed by a bolus for your epidural. Okay, how yes, do you sir. use anesthesia? Yes, sir. Uh, I'll pre-oxygenate the patient uh, for three minutes, sir, till the ET ETO2 of ninety uh, percent. I'll uh, I'll induce with uh, IV fentanyl of uh, fifty micrograms and uh, uh, with the IV propofol. Uh, patient sir, uh, forty-five kg, sir. So I'd like to okay. forty-five. So and I'd like to you give a IV fentanyl slow IV. So I don't want uh, uh, the fast IV might cause a chest wall rigidity also. So, and uh, following that, I will use uh, IV propofol, incremental doses uh, to avoid a uh, hypotension because uh, these patients are already prone for hypotension and their intravascular volume is also compromised. So I, I, will, I would like to uh, give an incremental doses and after, the, in, after confirming the loss of verbal response, I will I to check ventilation, sir. Uh, check ventilation. And, Paralyze with atracurium, sir. 25 mg, 25 mg, and uh, uh, ventilate for four minutes. 
and uh, secure an endotracheal use it under direct laryngoscopy uh, like to secure an endotracheal tube intubation with uh, uh, i'll take to check uh, uh, check the position by five point auscultation and continuous waveform capnography sir Vocal, should we have done rapid sequence induction intubation for this patient or is it okay to do the sequence of induction intubation as you described sir if there is an obstruction of a duodenum if there is a obstructive pattern i would have gone for an rapid sequence induction sir so since there is a no uh, obstructive pattern it's an elective surgery so uh, so this was my choice any dose changes would happen with regards to propofol in these patients so uh, propofol uh, there might be an uh, uh, as as said earlier sir, like uh, th there is minimal uh, effect uh, uh, only it, it doesn't going to uh, prolong much sir so depending upon the hypotension i would like to give an incremental doses sir obviously you, are, you will not be titrating the blood pressure to see the end effect of propofol yes, right yes, sir. you, yes, you yes, are sir. giving a titrated dose yes sir till the patient Yes, sir. verbal contact with you. Right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, that's a safer method instead of uh, speaking in terms of milligrams per kg dose in these patients. So give the titrated doses of propofol. Why did you choose atracurium, sir? Uh, coming to a neuromuscular agent, sir. So uh, I preferred benzoquinolone, like uh, because uh, uh, compared to the vecuronium. Uh, uh, which is majority excretion is via biliary excretion, sir. Uh, so the pro uh, the vecuronium um, um, blockade is more prolonged, sir. So uh, whereas atracurium is elimination is by Hoffman elimination and uh, ester hydrolysis, sir. So uh, preferably uh, I choose uh, uh, atracurium, sir. If uh, if cis atracurium is there, it is more a best option, sir. So in my institute we use atracurium. So I preferred with uh, atracurium. Sir. Why do you think cis atracurium is a better choice over atracurium? Sir, cis atracurium uh, is a cis isomer. What is it? It uh, doesn't form the laudosin compound that is formed from the atracurium. It uh, the, the compound that uh, laudosin basically crosses the blood-brain barrier and it is uh, uh, it has a potential to cause seizures, sir. So uh, and uh, the histamine release uh, from this atracurium is comparatively reduced in cis atracurium. So on the uh, uh, the effect is three to four times better than the atracurium uh, theoretically mentions. So, so uh, this is my so. Suppose I do not have atracurium or cis atracurium at my center. Do I postpone the case? Do I send him to another center having cis atracurium atracurium? What do I do? I would like to use uh, steroidal compounds like vecuronium itself. So it will be prolonged, or I'll use a neuromuscular blockade. Till uh, I'll assess them and uh, uh, till the I'll assess them and uh, repeat the dosage and uh, extubation. Also, I'll assess the train of four and I will take. Uh, uh, so it's take important it. to use a neuromuscular monitor when you are using intermediate acting muscle relaxants. Okay, the initial dose wouldn't be a problem, but it's always with the subsequent and the top of doses that you could have the problems, especially towards the end of the surgery with residual neuromuscular. Blockade. Yes, How sir. will you maintain anesthesia in these patients? Sir, I would like to use a nitrous uh, with the oxygen and the isofluorine, sir. Because uh, nitrous uh, it reduces my isofluorine. Uh, like isofluorine has a, in, in an obstructive jaundice, isofluorine has a uh, more sensitivity, sir. So more prone for uh, hypotension. So I would like to decrease the isofluorine dose by uh, by making the nitrous move so that my max is adequate max is achieved minimum alveolar concentration. But can nitrous oxide also give some problems to these type of surgeries? Yes, can sir. Surgeon, can the surgeon start complaining as the surgery proceeds? If it is was an uh, under uh, laparoscopic, sir. Uh, I would like. To, I would have avoided. Yeah. Since it, since yeah, it is an, since it is an open surgery, sir. So this was my choice. Sir. Yeah, especially if there is no obstruction, nitrous oxide should not be causing a problem, and definitely it reduces the requirement of the volatile anesthetics, isofluorine, 
in this case as you chose and hence the side effects of the volatile anesthetics will be decreased why did you choose isoflurane gokul over other volatile anesthetics yes sir so uh, in our institute uh, we uh, mostly use iso and sevoflurane sir so uh, i why i didn't use sevoflurane is that uh, sevoflurane uh, in case of uh, in, uh, like uh, in an obstructive jaundice its uh, its elimination is prolonged the recovery time is more sir, uh, more depending upon the level of hyperbilirubinemia sir so uh, comparatively this was a better option so why not desflurane uh, if available desflurane decreases your mac awake sir lowers your mac awake uh, when your uh, bilirubin levels are high so if available uh, uh, in our centers we uh, we don't use uh, desflurane much sir but if uh, uh, so if i give you the liberty to choose any of the volatile anesthetics irrespective of your center's practice which okay. one would you choose for sir, this i will i, will, I would uh, use a uh, desflurane sir so desflurane can you give me three reasons to choose desflurane over isoflurane yes sir so uh, first thing is that isoflurane uh, sensitivity is so high it might uh, intraoperatively uh, the hypotension might be worse sir. so uh, so comparatively desflurane doesn't have uh, much hypotension and uh, one good uh, advantage is that it has a lower uh, mac awake sir so uh, the patient to regain consciousness will be more uh, better in desflurane a liver case my concern is about liver any benefits with regards to liver uh, liver uh, the hepatic clearance sir. Uh, i mean uh, liver are the volatile anesthetics really metabolized much in the liver is that is, is that the concern or you spoke about the hepatic buffer response is the effect of the volatile anesthetics on the buffer response a major concern yes sir uh, it is a uh, Uh, response in the, on the uh, hepatic buffer response is affected with the uh, uh, inhalation agent sir that is uh, that is my concern sir so the least affected probably would be with desflurane okay sir. followed by with isoflurane okay, okay. but yes if you take into account the cost benefit and all those things yeah between desflurane and iso isoflurane desflurane might marginally be a little better than isoflurane but isoflurane is also definitely a good agent in liver pathology right so what what's your plan for intraoperative fluid management sir uh, goal uh, goal directed uh, fluid therapy sir with balanced salt solution so uh, with uh, i have a uh, intra intraoperative bp monitoring uh, with the uh, uh, pulse pressure variation and the uh, uh, stroke vol uh, volume uh, variation with urine output of maintaining more, more than 0.5 ml per kg per hour titrated may to be in a positive balance you mentioned about cvp in the be beginning central venous yes sir you you be monitoring cvp also Yes, sir. I, I would take the baseline uh, CVP uh, transfusion. Uh, you seem to have all the monitors. You are monitoring CVP, pulse pressure variation, stroke volume variation. Yes, sir. So my uh, patient is already a frail patient, sir, and uh, with the uh, with the disease as such, might uh, his homeostasis might be affected. So I would uh, want to give him a you uh, normal volume or kind of. What's the so, disadvantage of CVP over your stroke volume variation or pulse pressure variation to so, assess the fluid requirements? So, uh, so this stroke volume uh, variation, pulse pressure variation, are uh, more of a dynamic response uh, depending upon your uh, respiratory cycle. Uh, whereas uh, uh, your uh, central venous pressure is more of an uh, are you it it, uh, it it says about the preload uh, it, is, it is it is not a more uh, better way uh, assessing sir it's a static parameter static parameter so more this is more the dynamic measuring the pressures and then extrapolating it to the volume status of the patient yes sir, yes, sir. but with a patient with no comorbidities it might not be 
a significant factor, but when there are other comorbidities, it might influence. So I'm okay. not sure whether you would require all the monitors to assess the fluid status of the patient on okay. either CVP or dynamic monitors would be sufficient. It depends upon the luxury that you have. Suppose one hour's urine output comes out to be only 10 ml. What will be your action? Sir, uh, first thing I will see the hemodynamic status. Sir. So if there is a uh, decrease in BP, so uh, so yeah. I would I would like to uh, give a mini fluid challenge, 100 to 200, uh, uh, 200 ml uh, and assess it. And if I'll, uh, I'll also look for the uh, blood loss. If there is a blood loss, I will uh, uh, immediately ask for a blood uh, uh, blood uh, blood products. And uh, uh, if the BP is low, I'll start on colloid. And I don't I won't wait for that blood to come. I'll start on colloid and start on vasopressors to maintain a map of more than sixty five. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll uh, I'll wait for a urine output to improve, sir. It's maintaining map. Yeah, the urine output didn't improve further. Uh, so it may it may be because uh, uh, there may be excess third space loss, sir. So uh, it may be still under uh, corrected. So I would like to further uh, uh, in, uh, give up uh, fluid bolus uh, uh, fluid challenge and see if at all not improving, then I will go for an uh, diuretic. Which diuretic would you choose? Sir, I would use a uh, furosemide, sir. Furosemide 20 ml stand. Any yeah. reason you chose furosemide over other diuretics? Sir, uh, furosemide, uh, I, uh, more than the osmotic diuretics like mannitol, uh, which would uh, which would increase your uh, uh, intravascular volume and the, uh, the it might hamper the, the manitonal might uh, renal from already my patient uh, uh, renal injury uh, I'm worried about the renal parameters also. We are giving volumes boluses fluid boluses also. So volume is not a concern in this patient. It doesn't have any other cardiovascular pathology which yes, is restrict the volume status. Yes, sir. So we are we hesitant to use manitol for this patient? Uh, sir, uh, only my uh, uh, thought process was like already if the renal perfusion is uh, affected, so it, uh, mannitol might uh, uh, is contraindicated in case of a renal injury. So we, we are not giving mannitol at the cost of renal perfusion because the first step that you said in the management of this oliguria was to ensure that the patient is normovolemic. Is that yes, right? Sir. That's why yes, you sir. gave fluid boluses, fluid challenges, ensure that. Normovolemia is established, and then you move to the second step of diuretics. Yes, sir. Here you can have an argument between mannitol and furosemide. Yes, okay. sir. There are people who still believe that mannitol is superior to diuretic, mainly because of its inherent antioxidant properties, which might help not only in flushing out the tubules, but also. Okay help salvage some of the cells which are in the borderline in the kidneys. Okay. okay sir. Similarly, okay, sir. another point that you mentioned in the fluid management regarding the colloids could be debatable. That will lead okay, to another Pandora's box and a lot of questions as to which colloid you would choose. Would you choose colloids over crystalloids? Yes, sir. Okay. So, yes, sir. So you said colloid. Which colloid would you choose? The hydroxy ethyl starch, uh, I would choose it. Uh, okay. Just for a I, discussion on the starches versus gelatin versus albumin. Yes, sir. Okay. Right. What are the intraoperative problems that you can anticipate in this patient? Sir, intraoperative hypothermia, sir. Long okay. procedure. So, uh, and uh, analgesia, intraoperative uh, adequate uh, analgesia. You have ensure that your patient gets good analgesia. Anything else? Then, Any uh, other problems intraoperatively you can anticipate? Uh, Maintain normal volumia, sir, uh, and blood, blood loss. Massive blood loss can be there, blood yes. Uh, blood loss and, uh, 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 and uh, fluid, uh, adequate fluid therapy. Fluid shifts could be there. Yes, sir. Fluid shift could be there, sir. And uh, um, 
can you can you briefly enumerate if you were to implement eras protocol in this patient what are yes, the things that you would do just enlist them enumerate them so uh, so yes, sir, uh, so eras mainly uh, focuses on uh, the uh, early mobilization and uh, uh, prehabilitation and uh, uh, decreasing your uh, fluid uh, uh, decreasing the uh, npo status to this 2 hours uh, uh, minimum uh, uh, npo status and uh, restarting the feeds uh, as early as possible and uh, uh, yeah, yes sir so, so and the fluid restricted fluid therapy from uh, it has been mentioned in the ras uh, and uh, uh, pref uh, preferably for analgesia using a uh, no no uh, blockade uh, or a uh, neuraxial blockade for a pain and uh, yes sir and uh, dbt uh, prophylaxis and uh, uh, early removal of catheter so these are the things that the iras uh, uh, mainly focuses on sir so i will uh, yes sir the ambulation yeah yes sir. you you can voluntarily consciously put in a lot of efforts to implement the eras protocol in these major surgeries also and thereby make sure that the outcome is better right i think yes, we have come to the end of the time for the discussion uh we'll also i would like to say that see whenever yes, you are yes. presenting you should also in, uh, say about the pre induction monitors that you will place and yes, also sir. the post induction monitors i think that yes, was sir. missed out and uh, pre medication also was missed up in the pre operative yes, preparation yes ma'am yes ma'am okay, so you should include that so yes, that would be good okay yes, and uh, when you would not like to extubate the patient ma'am uh, if the surgery is very prolonged and uh, if there is an uh, uh, abg showing any uh, in hemodynamically unstable patient uh, and uh, uh, with uh, acidosis ma'am uh, with abg showing us doses and uh, decreased uh, urine output uh, uh, i would not extubate ma'am uh, and uh, hypothermia these are the conditions where i would uh, shift the patient to icu and plan for an uh, elective extubation right so i think we can answer the questions now from the audience uh, uh, the discussion is uh, the case presentation ends here Uh, Nishant, do you want us to take up the questions or? Sir, uh, as you wish, sir. And uh, I think first of all, we should allow Dr. Gokul to have a glass of water. He's been, uh, he's you, excellent, and he deserves a loud round of applause. One for owning up and being brave enough to present his case in front of everyone uh, for the in front of the whole so audience. And secondly, he's done very well. I'm sure he has. and uh, thank, thank you, you to krishna sir and maluga ma'am also sir if you want uh, i can read the questions or if you want you can uh, uh, you can do it yourself also uh, there are a few questions that are there uh, in the chat box yeah fine with either we can read that and probably address that is that okay yes sir perfect dr gokul could you stop sharing your screen please yes sir and if possible switch on your video gokul we want to see you now Yes, sir i am trying sir i am not able to says that the camera may, may, like it's not connected zoom is unable to detect the camera i am trying from that time stop sharing there will be a red button upper me yes sir dr malavika you want to address this question criteria for not extubating this patient because you brought up that issue yeah when the first of all here the patient is an elderly 78 year old patient so as i told the uh, regarding the prognostic criteria uh, this case also is more suggestive of a malignant of a cause for obstructive jaundice so along with his age so there are some poor prognostic markers besides uh, when the surgery goes on for a prolonged duration uh, beyond 6 to 8 hours and uh, when it is associated with significant blood loss and ongoing blood loss and uh, presence of acidosis and hypothermia i think these are the criteria when you should think of uh, ventilating him electively or post operatively rather than going for an extubation on table obstruction due to malignancy and operated for the same is not considered as a poor prognostic factor i think it was brought about in the discussion malignancy is also considered as a 
poor prognostic factor. Now, Dr. Lalit Kumar has uh, added some of the issues, some of the points with regards to preoperative instructions like mouthwash, having loose garments, and the fasting guidelines where actually you don't fast them excessively, but make sure that they drink a carbohydrate-rich fluid, clear fluid, two hours before the surgery. Uh, yeah, role of diuretics in acute kidney injury in obstructive jaundice. Dr. Gokul, sir, you, you favored uh, furosemide. So do you want to take this question, role of diuretics in acute kidney injury in obstructive jaundice? Uh, it's usually, I've seen uh, people use it. So uh, like, uh, so that's what I tell, I told sir, but uh, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure with the, uh, with your, with your point of uh, uh, mannitol, I, I'm, I would choose. The question choose is by Dr. Kanchan or Kanchan Chauhan. The point to be highlighted here is that maintaining normal volemia, correcting any hypovolemia takes a priority over administering any diuretics, be it mannitol or furosemide in management of acute kidney injury in obstructive jaundice. So diuretics will not be the first line of treatment. It's going to be always fluid resuscitation, fluid challenges, and then only the diuretics. Uh, somebody has said that can use epidural morphine. I do agree that you can use epidural morphine for a very good analgesia in these patients. Is mannitol better than furosemide? It is debatable again. Should we use goal-directed fluid therapy or restrictive fluid therapy for major abdominal surgeries? Well, this is again a long-standing debate. Definitely the traditional method of fluid therapy or liberal fluid therapy are not beneficial. We should not be following that. The goal-directed fluid therapy is reasonably okay, but as long as we set our goals properly. So suppose we use a very low tidal volume strategy during the surgery, then that will not be reflected properly in the pulse pressure variation or the stroke volume variation. Similarly, they would not be beneficial in laparoscopic surgeries. Being extremely restrictive in our fluid therapy can actually precipitate the kidney injury as well. And what's important is whatever goal-directed fluid therapy or restrictive fluid therapy you meticulously do in the intraoperative period should also be continued in the post-operative period. It's not that you follow very nice goal-directed therapy intraoperatively and once the patient goes into the post-operative ward, he receives liters of fluid, then the whole effort exercise is wasted and the outcome is not going to improve at all. Lot of appreciation for Dr. Gokul. There's a question, single shot epidural analgesia with bupivacaine plus buprenorphine is a practice. Yes, you can use buprenorphine instead of morphine or fentanyl as an opioid. Dr. Naresh uh, Paliwal has an interesting question. Can you not do this surgery on sole thoracic epidural? Well, if, if the surgeon is really fast, really gentle, and we are used to this technique, it could be considered. But you would require some amount of you know, sedation, adjuvant analgesics like ketamine because bubble handling could be painful, could cause discomfort to these patients. So considering the duration of the surgery and the extensive dissection probably one wouldn't venture to do this on sole thoracic epidural alone. Uh, urine output monitoring is not mentioned. Well, no, Dr. Gokul did mention, he said urine output monitoring also, and he also said that he would target aim for a urine output more than 0.5 ml per kg per hour. Uh, Dr. Malavika, do you want to take this question? If INR is an increasing trend two days before the surgery, it was 1.1 and on surgery day it is 1.5, can we put thoracic epidural? Um, I would uh, prefer to first of all uh, administer FFP at around 15 ml per kg 
not for the purpose of putting an epidural though um but for uh, the purpose of uh, reducing the bleeding and second thing i would not like to go for an uh, epidural when the inr trend is rising um and instead of that i would try to go for a multimodal analgesia along with the regional blocks like tap block um would be my choice so that answers the other questions uh, other options for analgesia subcostal tap block yes they could be used thoracic epidural at which interspinous level is specific for for pancreatic surgeries when we are using epidural opioids especially drugs like morphine one or two or even three levels up or down is not going to matter because the morphine is subsequently going to ascend cranially and is going to give good analgesia at variety of segment levels so we usually tend to choose somewhere between t8 to t12 because it's much easier to put the thoracic epidurals at this level rather than in the segments between t6 to t7 where the angulation of the spinous process would make it much more difficult what should be the choice of colloid hydroxyethyl starch or albumin or gelatins well the debate will keep continuing probably you would use a balanced salt solution as your first choice only when there is excessive blood loss then you would be considering these as the options albumin can be used but cost is one of the consideration there gelatins have come back to the picture especially since hydroxyethyl starch is being painted as a villain with regards to its effect on the coagulation system and the renal system but remember whatever colloid you are using make sure that you do not exceed the dose that is maximum dose that is limited i am saying dr sukhminder it's probably time to say thank you to everyone uh, there are some more questions epidural level bubble distension with nitrous oxide we did discuss about those concerns i think most of the other points have been addressed in the chat box over to you dr sukhminder i'm sorry if i took a little more time no no it's well uh, the discussion and the uh, way the answer it was real like a real examination room uh, somehow preparing them for the examination room rather both you and dr malvika uh, i think whatever you have done is just like a good teachers how do they do it and set an example because few questions should be left for the examination also otherwise whatever examiners the externals or internals will do when they go for the examination few questions should always be in the basket of the examiners uh, it's your liberty sir if you feel you can take one or two questions more before we can wind up and uh, discussion with so your i think your experience of taking this class that is very important we want the feedback of the teachers also actually after the class not before the class after the class you are an experience and dr marvika's experience how you felt while on this platform yeah uh, i think we did uh, sort of uh, especially dr malavika did mentor uh, gokul very well with regards to the preparation for this case so that put him at ease for presenting you know we didn't want it to go just purely like an examination but i was a little harsh on uh, gokul and uh, you know sprang up lot of uh, surprises and questions which i'm sure and i'm i'm really very happy that he handled them very well uh, thanks to his uh, extensive preparation on the topic so it was a mixture of good preparation and surprises as well so dr Thank marvika you. your points of view so i think um... we should prepare them now that he is in second year i think this is the time when she, he should be uh, uh, he should be exposed to all this and uh, they do not know the uh, most of them are theoretical in answering because they have limited years of experience so i think our experience adds on to them becoming more practical in their presentation so where we are able to give them uh, uh, some inputs from our uh, longer years of experience so i think that has also helped gokul in uh, presenting well uh, besides he has put in a lot of hard work so i would like to congratulate gokul for uh, doing well here thank you and this has been an excellent platform also for uh, all the post graduates we are able to connect to uh, them all over india so i think uh, this should keep going and it is very encouraging for teachers like us also 
and i think it's the bringing young talent also to the to this forum so including it has given me an opportunity to become a better teacher thanks a lot definitely i think all these points were con to consideration when we started the long case discussions uh, more importantly the giving the chance to the second year pg students is the ideal way to hold this long case discussion the final year students they are always under burden and you know it can have some uh, fluctuation of the confidence while going into the real examination and presenting here so second year i think is the ideal time to prepare for this long case discussion and the way the teachers are handling it uh, dr krishna was right in the beginning that it is bringing the variety of the teaching uh, talent from in the entire country and the way every teacher interacts is the different but uh, the best part is the students of our ns geology throughout india they are privileged to listen to them they are privileged to listen to these classes in the recorded version on the youtube later i think it is going to help them like anything uh, uh, regarding the work i think they are doing the maximum work in the hospitals uh, theoretical part they can go through the books but the teaching manuals the teachers they are, you know they are spread throughout the country Dr. Krishna has got very good points. Dr. Malvika has got very good points. Other teachers have their own good points. So it is just like imbibing all the good points on one platform and disseminating to the anesthesiology students. I think this is the way we are going forward, and soon we will be touching the hundred classes also on the uh, ISA uh, YouTube channel. So that will be the day of a historic day, and everything is available for them. I think to prepare them. to prepare idly for the examination this is the best platform i can think uh, if if i think if my students are there and dr krishna and dr malvika come as external for, for my student and i think that's how they can interact majority of the teachers who are teaching here they will be external to those students also and it will be very helpful they will have some confidence they will have some rapport i think in the coming time this is going to be a huge success all the long case discussion then the classes also we will be now intermingling these classes long case discussion short cases the spot diagnosis and any other thing which we i think on the we already started with the panel discussion on thursday and the ij webinar and uh, alternating with the panel discussion and soon we will be starting with the practical webinars also how to do it how to different you know different scenarios the practical difficulties how to come out from those so we will be uh, we are having a vision for that also and it was wonderful i think the way dr krishna and dr malvika today interacted with the uh, rising star gokul uh, he was full of confidence and he didn't do a uh, blunder the way i was thinking that he should not do and he didn't do uh, thank really you did, thank you so you did well although your video was off but uh, still you did well behind the scene thank you sir thank you sir thank you so much sir and uh, i think uh, so next some somebody is asking next class topic next class topic will be the Uh, non cardiac surgery in a ischemic heart disease patients that will be live on the next monday before uh, winding up i just want that anybody any senior person or anybody else want to suggest or want to add something i am allowing everybody to unmute themselves also so they can uh, raise their hand or they can unmute themselves and give the suggestions nishan you can coordinate now yes sir yes sir i mean Uh, all anybody who is interested in uh, some comment or some uh, for the classes uh, are most welcome sir as you mentioned these classes are important not because not only because there are post graduate students there are many young faculty also and uh, this is a good exposure for them on how to take a viva so today's class was really excellent in the way sir and ma'am uh, have carried the student forward uh, in asking the questions supporting them encouraging them encouraging them to get the answers uh, we have dr madhuri ma'am dr madhuri kodi dr navin malhotra sir uh, final words from any one of you dr madhuri unmute yourself you are muted yeah nishan these are not final words but uh, i think it was very it was a very uh, i would like uh, nice to see dr krishna as usual very clear very crisp and uh, excellent uh, control over the class and i also would like to congratulate malvika she is growing she is really a budding examiner 
and um, I, you're doing very well, Malvika. And um, as as already Sir has said that it is uh, when we are young, young examiners tend to learn from senior examiners. So I think this podium is a very nice place where, as we call young young examiners, they learn from the senior examiners how to ask questions and how to find out if the student really has understood the topic or not. So congratulations to both of you once again. Very well done. Thank you. Dr. Naveen wanted to say something, sir. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Bajwa. And uh, artist, congratulations to both the examiners and uh, Gokul, especially uh, for putting up over the last uh, more than around two hours or so. Obstructive jaundice is going to come in the exam as a long case, no doubt about that. And uh, even at some scenarios for daycare, GI surgical procedures also stenting uh, before going for the definitive surgery. Uh, so we have we are going to encounter obstructive jaundice in our clinical practice uh, as a an student also and as an, a clinician also. And most of the time it is the Whipple's procedure which is being done and all the aspects uh, pertaining to that particular surgery were discussed. And at times uh, we may go up uh, extending into the other aspects. But Gokul, well done and God bless you. And thank, thank you, you sir, for a nice and interactive class. Thank you. Thank so, you, uh, Bajwa sir, with your permission. Uh, Just yeah, ask yeah. if last minute anybody wants to suggest something or want to give their comments or suggestions. They are welcome. Yes, sir. We have uh, senior people also. Dr. Naresh Paliwal sir is here. Is he here? He is having a, going to have a very good uh, webinar. I think the panel discussion coming Thursday. Where is he, Dr. Naresh? Unmute yourself, please. You are on your video. I, I think he's there or not? He 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 is uh, he's on the screen, sir. I'm not able to see him. Where is he, Dr. Naresh? I'm not able to see him on the screen here. Anyway, I think anybody else you want to say something? I don't think so. Uh, otherwise, people would have raised their hand till now. But I think it was very absorbing class overall. Uh, I really felt very, you know, uh, I, I missed a little bit of it. I had some small meeting, but overall the class was fine with the Gokul presenting so in a, such a nice manner that teachers were encouraging as well as giving up some surprises also. Dr. Krishna, as usual, he's a very, you know, a little bit strict on those aspects. And teachers should be like that. So you can't be lenient every time. And Dr. Malvika was very to the point. Everywhere, I think he was faltering, so she was helping. So it was a good class, absorbing class. And Nishant anchored it very well. So Nishant, uh, your duty to close the proceedings here. Right. Thank you so much, sir. It is an honor to be uh, able to share screen with uh, such stalwarts. And uh, with an excellent class that we had today, I'm sure the viewership will be lots uh, after the class is over. Anybody uh, will be able to see this class again on YouTube. Uh, Dr. Mohan Patak want to say something. Dr. Mohan Patak, sir, unmute yourself, sir. Unmute yourself. Sir, unmute yourself. You are muted, sir. Sir, you will need to unmute yourself, sir. You are, you are muted. Sir, unmute. Yes, now he'll be able to unmute you, sir. Un yeah. huh. So these facilities were not available at those times, but it's a very uh, sincere effort to uh, improve the educational program. It will be very much helpful to the students. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your kind words, sir. And okay. definitely thanks. that is Actually, thanks to Dr. Bajwa, sir. Sincerely, uh, we're taking uh, all the parts of the exam, like uh, spot diagnosis and all, and case presentation and everything. Thank you, sir, for that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And this was an initiative, I think, done by Dr. Naveen Lotra, sir. And now oh, yeah. I'm the legacy, legacy year, forwards so, in a different yeah. manner. Yes, sir. Hello. And, sorry, and I, I think it's a platform to showcase the talent of our country from yes, all sir. the states. Ah, uniform, the... uniform teaching for uh, yeah. everywhere. Um, all yeah, the new people of the India. 
Bajwa, Dr. Naresh Paliwal is also... Naresh sir is here. Sorry, sorry, I was... Uh, I mean, there was a call. I was busy in the call. The time okay, okay, Naresh sir. Time. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Suggestions and... It's a very good, uh, actually, this motive for postgraduate students. Actually, not only for postgraduate students, but also for us. We are actually, I mean, uh, relearning the things which we have forgotten over the years. So very good for all. A very good presentation and case discussions and should continue. Yeah, definitely, sir. These are the real things. I think these words echo from almost everyone's heart, from the right from the senior teachers to the junior most consultant and the learning, uh, this one platform for every teacher, every examiner, as Dr. Madhuri also told. So the junior examiners, they can learn some good tips for the well, we're going to become seniors. About, I think. Uh, one more technique which I would add to this, which should not be told in the exams because it is not in the textbooks as yet. But this is a technique of segmental spinal with epidural. Yeah. yeah. Which this be, case can we be very be, well done. Sir, we will be dwelling into details on Thursday. At you can avoid so many drugs uh, for this. Actually, I asked the question specifically for that. What, yeah. what will you do if you get an accidental dural puncture? You just need to put in a catheter inside and you can do it in the continuous segment of spinal. That is the best option. You can avoid so many drugs along with your post-op analgesia. But mm -hmm. uh, in exams, I don't think this can be an answer. This is just for the I mean, practical thing. Which These can are be done. more of a, I think the barricades are there in the practical things in the real life yeah. scenario as well in the theoretical part. So these things, I think, come but into play. the things are coming in the by way of presentation and publications, the, I mean, within two, three years, it should get established as a technique, even in books. Yeah, when it comes in textbook, it becomes more safer and more easy to teach also, rather than giving adventurous. There is, the there is some, some mention in the Hedzik and Miller's also about thoracic spinals. There is just one page, half page, in both Miller's and Hedzik about thoracic spinal. No, nothing detailed. I think, sir, uh, why not Indian? They, they are better than the Miller, whatever the evidence. You go to the epidural, you know, number of epidurals being used in the America and number yes, of epidurals yes. used in India. We are far, far ahead in using the epidurals as compared to those populations. Yes. And our exposure is much, much better than theirs. So I think... Today only, uh, today only I got an invitation from Italy to present my topic. Actually, it's on 8th July. I'll be presenting. Actually, I am unable to go there, so I'll be presenting online. I think that so, that's the way to go. And very soon, in another ten, in a decade, we can have our own books, which can at least uh, can come to that some par with Miller. We have our Indian authors are there who are very well versed with the techniques and drugs and uh, you know experience, a lot of experience, the learning curve, the you know so much things are there. Only the thing is the exploring and compiling and compiling into one platform. I think that time will come within a decade only. That That's is my problem. vision that we can go ahead with a, a publication of our own book of India. I think from the society ISA, we can have our own textbook of anesthesiology from Indian Society of Anesthesiologists. That is one vision of mine. I think in another five years, we should be coming uh, out. At present, that. I know at least 10 students who have taken this as a thesis topic. Okay. At least 10. I mean, there may, there may be more than this, but uh, at least 10 I know. Oh. So, the people who contacted me, they have taken this as a thesis topic for a six month with different drugs and different additives for different procedures. So you had mentioned in the chat box that you, uh, whether we can do it in sole uh, thoracic epidural. Yes, it can be, but uh, depends on the patient to patient. If the patient is morbid, frail patient, it can very well be done when relaxation is not an issue. If the patient but is I... very morbid, frail, female patient, multiparous patient, it can be very well done. So Sir, actually, epidural. for these PG classes, we don't go into that far because those are our practical scenarios. Not this, this is just home. what he is asking. Can it be done? Can yeah, be done. it can be what done. Epidurals, it is given in books also. Segmental epidurals. For Sir, whatever the examiners, na, the examiners are yes, a different variety of examiners. They will not accept it. But you, you can say if the patient is very morbid, ill, frail patient with respiratory issues, then it can be a technique of choice. Rather than putting the patient on ventilator. Anyway, sir, we will be dealing with the details in the next uh, webinar on Thursday about yeah, all sure. the segmental things. It will be a detailed discussion on the platform. 
Okay. So for the present, I think it's a time to say goodbye to everyone. Thank you to the Thank you. Surpa Medical College, Manipal team, and all our dignitaries and senior people here who have taken active participation in the class. So I can only say from here, thank you everyone and uh, thank well you. done the team, the Surpa Medical College, Manipal. Well done, and uh, it's time to say goodbye. Long live ISA. Long live ISA, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.